Uh, Jim is a professor at the Institute for Social Research. That's the Suffer. other Suffer. Suffer. Oh, Suffer. <laughs> I know there's one in The other S word. The yeah. other <laughs> ISR, right? At Carnegie Mellon. He's also professor of the School of Computer Science. Yes, at Carnegie Mellon. But Jim is the quintessential case of somebody who can change his mind halfway through his career and still turn out enormously successful. So he has a PhD in psychology. He was a professor of psychology for a number of years. He decided, eh, not that. When did you get your JD? After I got that? that along with my psychology degree. Along with psychology. But so he's uh, in the Michigan Bar Association, although not active. Uh, then he came to the University of Michigan to get his master's in computer science. He worked with Gary and me in, on research. But at that point, we said, well, we can hire him as a postdoc while he's in the master's program. Because he already has a PhD. Right. So he worked with us for three years, got his master's. It was a wonderful time to work with him. And so I'm so delighted to have him talk to you here about the uh, one characteristic about Jim is he takes it up another level about thinking not about a particular process, but how it fits in a whole socio-technical system. So we're delighted to welcome Jim Herbslow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is socio-technical coordination. This is, what I'm really going to try to do is to give you kind of a synthesis of some research I've been doing over the last about 15 years, actually try to pull together empirical results uh, in theory, qualitative and quantitative methods, and try to paint kind of a, a picture uh, where I think I've been over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, so it really has kind of three pieces. One is a socio-technical theory of coordination that is work with Aldous Moskus. Uh, coordination and transparency with Laura Davish, Colleen Stewart, and Jason Tsai at CMU. And then testing the congruence hypothesis, I'll talk about what that is, with Marcelo Cataldo, Patrick Walt, uh, Wagstrom, and Kathleen Carley. Okay, so theory of coordination. Uh, as a place to start, there are a number of theories of coordination that kind of form the building blocks of the direction that I wanted to go with this. Uh, <clears throat> there are theories about product modularity, task modularity, the idea that organizations and Technical architecture tend to mirror each other, sometimes called Conway's Law. Collaboration over distance, then by some people that you may have heard of uh, here, who obviously were hugely influential uh, in my thinking about this whole area. Uh, in the ideas of implicit and explicit coordination, that coordination may happen through communication or other explicit means, but it often happens implicitly by people looking at the same artifacts, for example. Interdisciplinary theory of coordination that Tom Malone and Kevin Croson put together looking at matching uh, coordination mechanisms with kind of coordination problems and understanding that some mechanisms fit some problems. And social network analysis. Uh, Kathleen uh, Curley, one of the co-authors in some of my work, has been very influential uh, as well. So here is the socio-technical theory of coordination as we formulated it. Uh, if you want a more formal version uh, I have some papers I can point you to. I have found that it tends to put audiences instantly to sleep when I present it formally. <laughs> so I'm not going to present it formally. Uh, <clears throat> but the idea is that technical work like software development uh, progresses by making decisions. You make lots of decisions. You make decisions, for example, about selecting a particular data structure or a particular algorithm or making an architectural decision about the functionality of a particular component. Right, so the work progresses by making decisions. And it would be relatively simple if each decision was completely independent, but obviously it's not. So if I select an algorithm, or if I select a data structure, and you need to take data out of that data structure or put, store some data using that data structure, then I have constrained how you can do that, right, for better or worse. And technical work is just full of constraints like that, that some decisions are being made and are constrained by you can make for another decision. So if we think of technical work consisting of this network of decisions and constraints, that establishes a coordination problem. Right? It's basically a constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, and the organization somehow has to solve that problem. Okay? So just an example of how this theory would 
what perspective it would bring to a well-known coordination mechanism, let's take a look at modularity, modular design. Um, if you want to create modules, you look at a decision network essentially and find cut points. Right? So if I make this decision right here, then I've separated one subgraph of decisions from the rest of them, and now you have a disconnected subgraph. I might find you know, some other uh, set of decisions with a small cut set and make those decisions, and again, separate that out. Now instead of one big connected graph, I have three much smaller subgraphs. Right, so I've simplified the problem. And traditionally, then what you do once you've created a modular design is you assign each module to a different team. And teams have lots of coordination mechanisms available to them. Right? They usually report to the same manager. They've often worked together uh, for some period of time. They're often located near each other. Uh, they speak a common language, they're familiar with how each other works. There's all sorts of coordination means that a team has available to it. So the strategy basically is you cut the coordination problem down into these bite-sized chunks, each one of which is small enough that the coordination resources that a team has at its disposal can uh, coordinate that technical work. But of course there are lots of other uh, ways of coordinating work lots of other techniques and things that facilitate coordination. Geography, of course, is an important one. If a team or a group of people is co-located, they have many more ways of coordinating through face-to-face -face meetings, through having seen each other before, through informal communication over lunch, many ways of coordinating. Uh, people have worked together. There's lots of evidence that they can work much more effectively in collaboration, given a history of collaboration. Uh, Perhaps if you can predict the need to coordinate among particular people, uh, you could set up some coordination technology, just a chat channel or some other technology to just sort of uh, handle the coordination and improve their ability to coordinate some set of decisions. And one that I want to take a look at in some detail now, another way of coordinating work is what we're calling uh, transparency, which kind of makes work visible across an entire team or organization or even ecosystem. So GitHub <coughs> is a prototypical example of what we would call a transparent development environment. And by transparent, we like this definition of Bernstein's, the accurate observability of an organization's low-level activities, routines, behaviors, output, and performance. Okay, so when I say transparency, uh, that's what I mean. How many people are familiar with GitHub? Probably vast majority of people. So I won't spend much time uh, describing it. As you know, in GitHub, there's lots of information about people and about the work they do. So here's Brian, or sorry, Mike Bostock's uh, profile page. Mike has developed D3, very powerful graphic software that many people use. Uh, you can see a lot on here about him. You can see his, the popular repositories he has, the repositories he's contributed to. You can see how much work he's done every day for the last year, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's just a heat map, uh, and the darker the color, the more work he's done on that particular day. So you can see when he's been working hard, when he was goofing off, when he didn't do anything <laughs> here. He kind of tapered off at the end. He's kind of taken it easy now. Uh, or maybe D3 is complete and he's working on something else. So a lot of information about uh, Mike Bostock and the work he does. Uh, here's just another view. Uh, on D3, you can see when the work has been done over time. These are all views that GitHub provides. Uh, so Mike put in this work. Uh, here's his work pattern displayed another way. Here's, uh, sorry, this is the total work. Here's the work that uh, Mike has done. Here's the work the second most prolific developer has done, the third, fourth, if you want to look farther down. So you can really see how the work has been accomplished and when. Here is uh, another view that's really nice. It kind of shows the way you collaborate in GitHub. Uh, you simply fork a project, meaning you copy the whole repository into your uh, own space, basically. Then you can modify your copy. And then if you have some change that you would like to get back into the main project, you offer it as a pull request. Very simple mechanism. You say, here, please put this into the main repository. And the owner may then pull it in and make that change to the main repository, or may ask for modifications, or may just reject it. Uh, but you can see all that activity here with uh, many different forks, and someone has been working in this fork, 
Uh, and at this point, pulled in changes from this other fork, so that fork kind of goes away and makes more changes and so on. So you can kind of see all the parallel activity. If you have software on GitHub and somebody uh, forks it and starts to do work in it, you can see all the things that people are doing with your software, what experiments they're performing, how they're changing it, what they're doing with it. All right, now, one of the things that's interesting about GitHub is how highly interconnected projects are. This is uh, looking, taking data from the package manager, which kind of shows the dependencies, what depends on what. If you, if you take this one project, Twitter Bootstrap Rails, and look at the packages that it uses, um, it uses Action Pack, uh, Exec.js, Rails, and Railtees. Taking just one of those, Action Pack uses all of these uh, libraries, and or they may not be libraries, but it uses all of these uh, projects. Action View uses all of these, and it actually goes out farther. This is just part of the graph, and you can see that each one of these can be expanded in a similar fashion. So the point is, we have uh, on GitHub about 30 million repositories now. The number is about doubling every year. Uh, we have uh, something in the order of 12 million developers. And they're working on projects that are this densely interconnected. Right, so if I'm a user or a developer of Twitter Bootstrap Rails, a change in any one of these packages down here could potentially cause me problems. Right? Uh, and so how does all this stay coordinated? It's one of the questions that I think is really interesting about GitHub. If this were all in a company, you'd have elaborate management procedures, you'd have road mapping of when versions are going to change so everybody could anticipate it. You have basically none of that here. You have people changing their projects and kind of do uh, what they want. All right, so if we look at how that sort of maps onto this uh, model or theory of coordination, decisions and constraints, the key cross-project decisions are things like which code to use, right? I have my project, what code do I want to use in that project? How do we coordinate the changes? What do I do about changes that might disrupt me you know, from code that I'm using? What do I do, if anything, about changes I make that might disrupt people who are using my code? How do we manage changes? Uh, should I accept code? Somebody makes a pull request to me, they've done something in a fork, they want me to put this code into my main branch, should I do that? Some stranger just kind of offering me code, it could be malicious, it could be incompetent, it could be uh, who knows what. And should I submit code? I've made a fork of your project. I make some changes to it to make it more useful for me. Should I go to the trouble of kind of giving you a pull request when you may ask me to do more work and so on? Should I bother to go ahead and try to contribute it to you? So these are some of the key decisions that we've discovered developers uh, use information in this environment uh, to decide. So this establishes a coordination problem. Uh, the organization, or in this case, uh, an ecosystem with uh, you know like 12 million people, uh, must solve somehow. All right. So for this study, we this is a qualitative study. We did 48 interviews. Actually, one more since this was written. We sampled projects based on the size and developer affiliation. We wanted both large and small projects, and developers that were affiliated with companies and developers that appeared to be uh, working independently. Uh, we analyzed the artifacts, so, so if they, in an interview, mentioned a particular pull request, we'd go pull it up and look at it and examine the artifacts as well as what they said about it. The unit of analysis is the coordination instance. So the developer noticing that something has changed, they need to do something about it, or that they're changing something that could cause a problem, something comes up that makes them realize some coordination may be necessary, then what do they do, and then when do they decide that that uh, instance is complete? That's kind of our unit of analysis. So we did typical open coding, iterating between literature and data, stopped at theoretical saturation where we weren't finding uh, any, any more codes and nothing new about any of the existing codes. All right, so we identified several transparency practices, some of which I'll talk about a little bit here. Uh, information seeking, people needed in this huge environment to go find out things. Uh, expressive actions. It's really interesting that 
if you're working in this kind of environment that automatically records everything you do, then every action that you take in developing the software is not just an element of work, an element of development, but it's also potentially a communication <coughs> to somebody, some audience, somewhere. So we'll look at the expressive actions that people undertook, and finally, community mm -hmm. practices. Given that individuals engage in certain kinds of information seeking and engage in certain kinds of actions to express themselves, that enables community practices that help solve uh, some problems. I'll talk about some of those as well. Um, so scouting is one of the behaviors we see. People just go out and look for interesting projects. They want to assess the functionality and the potential of a project, either to use it, or they might find projects that are interesting just because they're working on a similar technical problem and they want to see how it progresses so maybe they can learn from it, compare what they're doing to, to this new project. Uh, to do this, they aggregated, they examined aggregated traces of activity, looking at this project, saying, well, what happened on this project? Uh, how many commits are there? You know, are they commits coming in recently? Who made these commits? Uh, the number of people watching a project, that's a quote of one of our developers, uh, that were watching a project or people interested in the project, obviously it's a better project than something that has no one interested in. So thinking about using something, uh, developers can star projects that they find interesting in GitHub. So if it has lots of stars, you know, probably a better project. Uh, the activity level, recency and diversity of activity, are there changes going in? How recent are these changes? Developers don't want to get stuck with a dead project. What you want to do is you want that project to go on, to move ahead, to be maintained, to have its bugs fixed, to stay current, <clears throat> and you can keep using the current version of it. If the community that's maintaining it goes away, then if you want to still use that software, you have to do all that yourself, which is not you know, a good thing. So they're looking for some evidence that this is, there's a live community behind this project that will, that will keep going. All right, so once you make the decision to use a project, you're now basically engaged in a fairly long-term relationship with the, that community that maintains that project. Uh, because you, know, you must rely on them if you have changes that you need in their project so you can continue to use it, you're relying on them to allow you to do it, to, to accept your pull request and make a change. You're relying on them to continue updating it uh, for new versions of other libraries and operating systems and so on. So it's an ongoing relationship once you start to use their software. <clears throat> you monitor to avoid conflicts and find new features. Uh, so if I don't want to be taken by surprise by changes in this project that kind of wreck some functionality uh, that I have. And people attended to both upstream and downstream dependencies. I want to know how I'm going to affect my users. It's very prestigious to have lots of people using your software. If I do something that disturbs them or destroys its utility, they're all going to go away and I'll look bad. I'll lose my audience, my followers, and my users. Um, so upstream monitoring looking for code you can use, or code that you are using. I watch this project, that's to make sure they don't break anything, but also if they added a feature that would simplify some of my code, perhaps I would want to use it, so I keep an eye on that. That's one of the things people look for when monitoring. Downstream monitoring is when you're concerned about your users, it's important that I can see the forks, see what the people are trying to do, and I can comment right away and say, no, don't do it that way, do, you know, do this other, change it this other way, it'll work much better. Um, can ignore the bad changes, but you know that the network of experiments can continue. Right? All this change in the forks, some of it you don't want, but some good things will come out of it. Um, so now changing from information seeking to expressive actions. Um, everything you do, essentially, every commit, every comment is publicly visible in GitHub, so every bit of work, as I said, is also potentially a communication so people are quite aware of that, and they change how they behave so that uh, their actions are understandable. It gives them, they have a real or imagined audience, they have a sense of accountability, what they do, they feel like they're under a magnifying glass, people are watching. That's a little bit like Panopticon, aren't you familiar with this? Uh, Jeremy Bentham, the ideal prison design. Right, so you have one watcher sort of in the middle, and all these cells that are open to the middle. And uh, the watcher, you never know where the watcher is watching. Nobody can see the watcher. 
So one person, because of that uncertainty, nobody knows if they're being watched or not, right? They're all sort of held accountable by this one watcher who's in the tower who nobody knows where he's looking. So it's a little bit like the panopticon, because you don't know if anybody's watching your stuff or not, but they might be. They might make rude comments about you or if they think you're inept, right? So it sort of holds you accountable. What's interesting is, I mean, developers have known for a long time that so-called literate programming is really important. You, know, you write a program so that you can read it. Don't just worry about the computer being able to read it. You have to be able to read it, and other people should be able to read it. So, because you're going to have to come back, come back and modify it, or fix bugs, or come back and understand it at some point. So everybody knows that. But what I'm talking about here is not just literate programming that you can read the code and understand the code you've written. They want to make their actions, the actual work, each change. Uh, they want to make that interpretable. Okay, so that someone can come back and say. Ah, I see the sequence of changes you made. It really makes a lot of sense that first you did this, you divided the work up into this chunk, and the next you did this, and next you did this. They want that sequence, that workflow, that way of decomposing the problem to be understandable because they want their audience to think they know, you know how to program well. So they make small changes, each for a single purpose, each one's understandable, and the sequence uh, is understandable. Um, yeah, so here's a quote of this idea. You should be able to go through the commit messages, and that should almost help you get a feel for how the project works or what it does, or it should also be instructional as a learning tool. Um, and people even edit the work history to move, remove irrelevant things. So if I'm making some changes and I made a misstep and made a mistake in my programming and I have to back it out, well, I'll just erase that part of the history, <laughs> partly to preserve my you know, <laughs> image but also because if people are trying to understand what I'm doing, that would just be misleading. It doesn't help you. It's like, like when you write papers, right? You don't put the whole autobiography of the project in there. You write it as if it was all a clear, simple story from beginning to end, and you knew what you were doing at every step. But <laughs> any fumbling or mistakes are just sort of edited out. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to have any work in progress commits. That's silly. That's stupid. You don't want to actually see that in the history. It's kind of clutter. So we try to make it nice and clean and tell kind of a good story. Uh, and who is this audience that's watching? Uh, developers actually think, many of them, think quite a lot about that. They get an impression of who the audience is by you know, the kinds of questions they get, uh, the kinds of comments that people make on their, on their code, uh, the changes that users make in the forks, you know, what they're doing with it. That gives an impression of who their audience is. And the current messages are kind of tailored uh, to the audience. You know, if it's a very general audience, they describe things at a very high level. If it's an uh, audience of just a few hackers doing the same thing as they are, they can be you know, very much down to the bits and the bytes. So we generally explain it to people that know the code base. So in this case, th these are other people like us who know this code. If you know what's going on in the code, you should be able to read a commit message and have an idea of what it's affecting, what this change is going to affect. OK, so building on those individual practices of seeking information in particular ways, of changing the way you work to make your actions interpretable, uh, certain communi community practices have evolved. Uh, so proactive conflict resolution, it allows people to identify conflicts coming down the pike. Uh, so you monitor upstream right, for a quick reaction to things. You anticipate downstream conflicts uh, because of actions, for example, that you've seen in forks. Uh, so here's one. Fellow who says, I saw somebody trying to use my project with a Rails master. I'm like, well, crap, I don't know if it works with the Rails master, so let me check. Proactively, uh, you know, taking care of that problem before it actually comes up. Uh, it also permits well-timed intervention. So one of our collaborators noticed that I was making a change, so he noticed, yeah, it's a very interesting file format. They worked in microcopy, and they told me it would be nice to have support for that file format. So. In a few days, they were both working together with me on trying to put this code together. So in other words, he noticed when they were working on file formats and proposed working on one that he wanted right then, and the timing was right. That was a good time to think about file formats. And people create opportunities for, for downstream users to intervene when they're making a change. So posting work for feedback or soliciting wish lists and desired contributions. Um, they don't know who's using their stuff. That's one of the characteristics of GitHub. They don't know who's using it or how they're using it. 
So they're trying to sort of broadcast to the world what they're about to do so they can get feedback so they don't destroy anybody else's uh, code. Uh, one effect of this, it kind of reduces experimentation on large projects because we, we talked to one developer who is very, very well known, uh, has probably more followers or just you know, as many followers as anybody on GitHub. And he was just really, really nervous. He was stressed. He was very stressed out. Uh, because anytime he would make a change, he was afraid that he would do something that somebody would decide looked stupid or wasn't the right way to do it, and he'd get you know thousands of comments, and people would just diss him in public. You know, some people can be very rude in these kinds of forums. And so he was afraid he was just going to get piled on. So he just made little, the tiniest possible change, never taking any risks. Uh, but then he had other projects where you know there were like six people using it, and he didn't do anything. He'd experiment, and you know, if it breaks, fine, who cares? Um, but they felt a lot of pressure on the big projects. So it kind of this kind of focus of attention may very well reduce experimentation uh, on some large projects. Uh, obviously, people are watching because a lot of people are starting to depend on it. I can't do anything too crazy to mess that up. So typical kind of quote there. One of the things we saw was sort of political wrangling about who has to pay the costs of something. Um, so the owner of the repository has what you could think of as hard power. <coughs> you can't get anything in that repository unless they say so. Right? They just control it. But other people have kind of soft power. Uh, they can exert this soft power for a desired change. You just sort of directly lobby. You say, hey, you know, this is a better solution. You should do it this way. Make everybody's life easier. Or you can also rally the community. Not just me giving you pressure. Uh, you can do something like this. Basically, another developer just tweeted a suggestion. He has tons of Twitter followers, so they all just got on there and said plus one. Here's somebody didn't really want to make this change, but after you know got a few hundred plus ones, he decided, okay, okay, I guess I'll have to go ahead and make that change. All right. So to sum up this part, we've taken a close look at some aspects of transparency as a coordination. Back at them, some of the decisions that are made and how transparency helps to coordinate uh, these decisions. It kind of shares characteristics with other kinds of transparency, like co-present workspaces and shared artifacts, because they're looking at the same things. They kind of see where other people's attention is and so on. It's kind of a virtuous cycle. You could say a visibility. People can see what other people are doing. And that creating a desire for legibility. OK, I better work in a way that people can understand, which then makes stuff, you know, more people can see more things. And so it's kind of a cycle where now I have to work harder even to be legible. And then the tool features of automaticity, everything's recorded automatically. You don't have to do anything special to record a trace of each step in your work. It just is automatically recorded. Automaticity, persistence of the data, and mutuality provide the particular kind of transparency affordance here. Mutuality means uh, there's a kind of equal power relationship. I can see what you're doing, and you can see what I'm doing. Uh, you might get very different kinds of behavior if, the, if it was not mutual, but rather uh, one person was able to see others and they couldn't see anything. Uh, so transparency seems to substitute for many kinds of formal coordination mechanisms in this context. All right, so back to theory now. So I hit into the final section of the talk here. The network of decisions establishes a coordination problem that the organization has to solve. We could also represent the theory this way, more of a, I don't know, sort of a social science representation. So we have some decision network structure and we have coordination techniques that are applied to solve that coordination problem. And this is kind of where we've been focusing so far, is just on decisions and how decisions relate to some other decisions, and on transparency as a means of coordination. Now we want to look at the, the larger picture, all of these boxes. So if we're going to test this theory and see if it actually pans out and successfully describes our phenomena, we need some way of measuring the structure of a network, this decision network. Uh, if we can then measure the decision network, <clears throat> we also need some way of measuring what coordination techniques are applied. And then we need a way of comparing this coordination network 
with the coordination techniques to see if they're a good fit. Are they congruent with each other or not? Uh, and if they're a good fit, then we should see some effects. We should see uh, bugginess reduced and productivity increased. Okay? So this is the whole uh, theory, and these are the research challenges. How do you measure those? How do you compute congruence? And how do you determine the effects of high or low values of congruence? So that's what I'll look at next. All right, so here's the network of decisions and constraints uh, we just looked at a minute ago. And of course, equivalently, you can represent this as a matrix. Right? So uh, non-zero value in a cell you know, means that there's an edge between these two nodes. Right? So this is an equivalent representation. It's just a little bit easier to think about, I think, for this part of the talk, the computations we're going to do. Uh, so you, know, you can see the D5 uh, is related to D3. It's a constraint between them. Um, but actually, recording, if you're going to actually think about using real data, recording every single decision uh, is really kind of impossible for a large software project. But potentially, you could sort of aggregate the decisions up a little bit and get some you know, measure of the, the network. Not the full network, but a sort of a condensed network. You can imagine that a file, file of code, just represents some set of decisions. Right? Some set of decisions have been made in this file. So you can think of that as a set of decisions that have been made. So you can sort of aggregate decisions up to the level of files. Okay? And then if you do that, now you have a matrix that is files by files. And there are a number of ways that you could uh, measure dependencies between files. And we've tried a number of ways. You could construct call graphs, for example. The thing that works best for our purposes is looking at the change history. Right? If two files get changed together in the same kind of modification request or in the same task, uh, then presumably that means there's some kind of dependency between them. You don't necessarily know what it is, but why would they be repeatedly changed together uh, unless there was some kind of dependency between them? So that's the measure that we're going to use here our data for measuring the relationship between two files. Um, now, obviously, who are we going to put in the matrix? Uh, um, yeah. I, I couldn't resist that. If you haven't seen this movie, you should go watch it tonight anyway. But, uh, OK. So <clears throat> you can think now also of decision, a decision assignment matrix. Who's making these decisions? Okay, so you have all the decisions across the top. And Morpheus uh, owns D1, Agent Smith, we don't like him, he only gets one decision, uh, Neo gets several. <laughs> uh, but again, you can't really probably record every single decision, but you, if we think of a file as an aggregation of a bunch of decisions, we can look at this, who has modified file 1, who has modified file 2, and so on, and you can create a, a sort of aggregated version of this decision assignment matrix by looking at which people have modified which files. Okay. And then if we just take this decision assignment matrix that we were just talking about, we take the decision constraint matrix that we talked about just a moment ago, then we take the decision assignment matrix and apply the PowerPoint transform operator. <laughs> We get a uh, transpose of the uh, decision assignment matrix. And with some matrix multiplication, you can see that at the end, you come out with a people by people matrix, where each entry represents the extent to which this person makes decisions which have constraints with the decisions made by this person. Okay. So that's kind of the meaning of this. And we call this the coordination requirements matrix, which is computed from you know, data from a project. Jim, a quick clarification. Um, in your uh, person to file matrix, mm -hmm. all of those have only one person per file in your example. Right. Is that a, cons a constraint, or is that just the example? No, it's just the example. Okay. Every file has more than one person. Okay. And these matrices are. You know, there's thousands and thousands of files involved, so they're much larger than this. Uh, okay, so 
That's the uh, coordination requirement <coughs> matrix that I was just talking about. Now, we'd like to be able to compare that to the actual coordination that happens on a project. Right? So we could, we could uh, measure various kinds of actual coordination as another person-by-person -person matrix okay? by putting ones, for example, if two people are on the same team, we put a one in that cell. If they're on different teams, there's no entry in the cell. So we can represent team structure as another matrix. Okay. We can <coughs> measure geographic location as another matrix. If they're at the same location, they get a one. If they're in different locations, empty cell. We can measure the use of chat. Right? So we have some chat data from actual projects. And if two people were talking in a chat about some specific piece of work, we can put a one uh, in that cell. If they were not, we leave it blank. Okay. And also online discussion. In particular, we're looking at discussion in a bug tracker. So presumably, discussion in, uh, in, within a particular bug of a bug tracker is talking about that bug, that piece of work. right? So again, who discussed something in there, we can represent a one you know, if that person was involved in the discussion and in blank if they're not. Right? So they sort of connect through that discussion or not. All right, so now we have <coughs> four different kinds of coordination possible here. And we can then you know, compare the coordination requirement, the coordination that we computed was needed with the coordination that actually happened in these different ways. All right? And we can compute a very, there's a bunch of ways you can do this. We used a very simple measure of congruence with what we're calling it. So over here, take all these cells that are not zero. Those are the places where coordination is needed. What proportion of them are also non-zero over here? Coordination actually happened where it was needed. And so this would be an example of perfect coordination. That would be you know, 100%. Um, <clears throat> but if one of these was missing, then that means it's less than 100%. If this extra communication over here, we just sort of throw it away. We don't know what they're talking about. But as far as we're concerned, it's kind of irrelevant. OK? So we now have potentially four measures of congruence. How well does team structure match the needs of the work? How well does geographic location match the needs of the work? How well does use of chat match the needs of the work? And how well does their online discussion match the needs of the work? OK? Now, what we need to do <coughs> is take several thousand work items. And for each one of those work items, we compute the coordination requirements. And we compute uh, the congruence, each of those four kinds of congruence for that work item. You know, how well the structural congruence, how well the team structure matched the coordination requirements, how well the geographic congruence matched the coordination requirements of uh, the uh, bug report discussions <coughs> and the chat. Okay, so we have four different measures of congruence. And we put it all into a big regression model trying to predict how long is it going to take to complete that work item. Okay, we're trying to predict that and we have all of these um, predictor measures in the model. Um, <coughs> so you can see, you know, to control for all sorts of things, we, we included things like uh, uh, priority, what was the priority of this work item? If it's higher priority, it should be faster. And in fact, it was. Uh, was it reassigned? So if it's reassigned, it's going to take longer because the assignment process takes time to happen. Uh, was it a, <coughs> a bug reported by a customer? Well, presumably that's going to be fixed faster than one that's just found internally. You know, how big was the change? Uh, what was the team load? How many MRs was, was this set of people working on at the time? Just a bunch of things to try to say, we know that these are all going to impact how long it takes to, to you know, make a change. So we're going to put those in the model to sort of control for those statistically. All right, so when we do all that, we, in our regression model using ordinary least squares regression, we find that we have uh, significant negative coefficients for all the kinds of congruence, meaning more congruence means shorter times okay, for completing the work. Um, yeah, so there's more details here, but that's kind of the main point. Um, we also looked at uh, the impact on bugginess. So here, you take for each file, you look across all of the change requests that have touched that file, 
and you say, what's the average congruence of all those change requests? And that gives you a measure of the congruence with which work was done on a particular file. Okay? And so it should be the case that, <coughs> that um, files that were worked on in a more congruent manner should have fewer bugs, you would expect. We looked at how many, what was the probability, we're trying to predict the probability that a bug was ever traced to this file. Okay? So this is a logistic regression. These are incident, what is it, IRR, and logistic regression, incident res rate response, I think is the, yeah, the way to interpret this is uh, it's a negative relationship if it's less than one, positive relationship if it's greater than one. So these are all negative relationships. Structural congruence reduces bugginess. Um, geographic congruence reduce, didn't reduce bugginess. We didn't see any effects for geography. We saw effects for the right people chatting and the right people uh, having bug discussions. Okay, so each of those, in each case, more congruent, more congruence in the communication channel means you know the work, uh, the work on that file was less likely to have injected a file, a bug into that file. Okay. Gary. Those numbers are what, like beta weights or coefficients. No, I think it's it's a logistic regression. It's an IRR. It's an incident something rate. I forget my logistic. Why, why is the one that has the biggest value the only one that isn't significant? Uh, because significance in this, uh, the stronger the negative relationship, the smaller the, the coefficient. It's a little bit like an odds ratio, right? So uh, numbers above one are positive, below one mean a negative relationship. Um, and then by the way, we did replicate um, all of this uh, in a project from another company, doing completely different kind of software. And we couldn't access all of the variables that we used here. We didn't have all the control variables, but uh, the results came out essentially identical uh, with the impact both on uh, bugginess and on you know, time to complete. So we did see kind of both effects. Uh, interestingly, uh, this, is data, this is data from the first project that we looked at, and this is data just from the top contributors. Um, it, you know, software productivity varies tremendously among individual developers. Uh, in this case, there were 114 developers, 18 of them wrote half the code. Uh, the other 94 wrote the other half of the code, uh, which is not that unusual, actually. Uh, but we're looking now just at data from those top 18 developers. And I'll tell you how the data from the rest was a little bit different. What we see over time, is this is data from four releases of the same product. And we're seeing that over time, the degree to which team membership right, was created the connections that you needed for the coordination requirements. Right here at the beginning, pretty much the people you needed to interact with or coordinate with were on your team, you know, 60, more than 65% of the time. Similar on release two, but all of a sudden on release three, uh, most of the time, the people you need to coordinate with are not on your team. Uh, and similarly, even lower on release four. Right? So the work here kind of cuts across teams more than on the early releases. But what's kind of interesting is if we look at IRC congruence, this is degree to which the people who are in a chat are actually those people who need to coordinate. Uh, we see that it starts pretty low, you know, a little over 0.4 on release one, goes up a little bit on release two. And it goes way up on release three and up to like 73% or something on release four. Uh, and similarly, for chats in the, in the bug tracker or discussions in the bug tracker, <coughs> starts out really low, <coughs> goes up to 0.6, and finally up to 0.8 and up in the high uh, 70s over here. So it sure looks like we're seeing uh, some compensation of you know, the team, for some reason, the team structure doesn't work that well for coordination in the later releases. And these top developers seem to be substituting, you know, communication in these cha electronic channels, right, for the coordination that's no longer handled by team membership. It kind of looks like we're seeing some compensation here, some adaptation. Yeah? Do the coordination requirements change over releases? You can imagine later releases might involve 
different interactions among modules than the early releases. Yeah, they did. <coughs> I'm not sure if they changed systematically, but they certainly were different. I don't know any way of characterizing, you know, how systematically they changed. But yeah, they changed. We did look at how volatile the coordination. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. My throat is not. I've not made it clear to my throat that the cold is over yet. <laughs> uh, okay, so we looked at how volatile the coordination requirements were, and uh, they became very volatile towards the later stages. Um, it was, you know, something like 80% of the people a developer needed to coordinate with were different from one week to the next. So they did become quite volatile, which probably helps explain why they had used these electronic means. Um, Remind me again, what is team congruence? What is congruence? Team? team. Ah, it's the extent to which the coordination requirements match the team matrix, and who's on the same team. In other words, high congruence means that all these people that you need to coordinate with are on your team. It's just the way the, the company defined their teams. Okay. Yeah. Is this an open source project on GitHub? No. No, this is, oh, sorry, I should have been uh, clear about that. No, this is a commercial company. Uh, they were in the data storage uh, industry. And this was data from four releases of their one product. It's actually a startup that came out of CMU. <laughs> get access where you can. <laughs> uh, and the lead author actually was uh, a lead architect at this company while this was being done. Um, that's how we got the data and convinced them that, yeah? I was wondering the effect of modularity on these on, on this, this results. Do you have the chance to analyze or the, or the topology of the system? For some files, they have a lot of dependencies and other files, not as Yeah, well. that's a good question. We didn't really. Look at that. I can tell you that uh, uh, team congruence is very related to modularity on the project because it was designed from the beginning to kind of uh, have an ideal team structure that mirrored the component structure of the software. So they divided it up into, I think they had eight components and five teams, if I remember right. So some teams had more than one component. And they tried very hard to make sure that each team was doing exactly one component. So that, that was the design from the beginning. So when you're looking at the team uh, congruence, that's you could also that, you know it's also reflecting the modular congruence that that really the changes weren't confined to just one module in the later uh, releases, and that's a fairly common finding actually in software. You know, architectures deteriorate. That's the way some people talk about it. Okay, let's hold the rest of the questions. Let them finish. Okay. <laughs> Clearly, we're interested. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm almost there actually. So just to review, so we talked to you, this is kind of the theory overall, and I talked about how the decision network structure, how we measured that in, you know, by aggregating up to the file level, right? I uh, talked about measuring the coordination techniques, also in matrix form, who's on the same team, who chatted about something. Uh, computing congruence, pretty simple computation about the proportion of places where coordination was required, where it actually happened. And then those regression models were kind of measuring the effects both on productivity, productivity and, and bugginess. So uh, future directions, it's my last slide, I think. Um, you know, there's many kinds of artifacts, not just code. And I'd like to understand better how coordination happens with design, with bug reports, with tests, with all sorts of things that are involved in development. Um, <coughs> and the many different ways to aggregate uh, decisions. As I said, I don't think you can find every single one and measure them individually, but there are lots of other ways you could measure aggregating them. Uh, those should be interesting to look at. Also, we didn't look at you know, what's the temporal order or piece of decisions. It's also quite possible that the kind of coordination needs you have early in a project are quite different from the ones that you have late in the project. I think Gary were kind of hinting at this, that it's gonna change over time and perhaps in a systematic way. Uh, so it may well be that the kind of things that you bring to bear to facilitate coordination should evolve with the project. Um, and what is the full set of techniques people can use to coordinate? That's a surprisingly hard question because there are all sorts of implicit ways of coordinating. Uh, coordinating
coordinate because you worked together before, you remember how the other person works and what they're likely to do, and that's a very hard thing to kind of get your uh, hands on. But what is the full set of techniques? I think we don't have a good handle on that yet. And one of the things I think would be of great practical importance is to understand, can we substitute some things for other things? So for example, uh, if you don't want to have a big heavyweight software process where you define all the steps and do all that, well, can you cut back on process if you have more collaboration technology, for example? Um, what are the trade-offs? Can one thing sort of substitute for another? Um, don't know. It's kind of an open question. Um, they may complement each other. And maybe the collaboration technology is much more effective where you have sort of a defined process that creates a common vocabulary, some notion of a set of steps, and so on. Um, and can we learn how to compose these different techniques? So if you have a software project, can you somehow at the beginning uh, understand the coordination needs and say, OK, well, for this particular project, we need this level of collaboration technology. These two teams, because of the nature of the components they need to coordinate, they have to be co-located, uh, you know, and just sort of compose some set of things for the particular needs of a given project. And can you match, can we sort of predict what decision network's going to look like for a project and uh, match those networks with techniques and context, you know, to sort of handle what they need. And if it's, for example, things aren't going well, what can you change mid-project? Uh, without disrupting uh, the ongoing work. All right, so those are some of the questions for the future. And that's it. So we'll pass the mic for the next set of questions, but I have one to start because I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested in taking this outside the world of software and the whole idea of trying to think ahead of time about who needs to talk to whom about an open problem. Mm -hmm. Let's take research as a problem. Mm -hmm. How do I know who I'm going to have to work with? What are those decision networks? Yeah, so that's outside a, of software. <clears throat> that's a great question. I think that I think there's not much you can do until you start to divide the problem up. You know, sort of until you have kind of high level architecture of your paper or your project, for example. Uh, then you can start to think about what are the connections among the people who are doing these different parts. And one of the things I've been advocating but haven't had a chance to try yet is to, to say that I think there's two things that kind of determine the nature of the connection between two of these high-level parts. One is how complicated is the interface? Is it really simple? You know, I just do this and hand it to you? Or is it you know, a lot of interaction that has to happen? Uh, the other one is how uncertain is it? Uh, so. You know, I think this is going to be simple. We think this is going to be simple. We don't really know. We don't know anything could happen here. That uncertainty, you know, could create the need to sort of renegotiate the whole thing. And those two kinds of problems have different solutions. So the complexity, you know, document it. If you know what it is, but it's complicated, well, make sure it's well documented. And you transparent. Know, transparent. Yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and for the other, the uncertainty, you need better means for people to coordinate, negotiate, and communicate because the uncertainty means they're going to have to do collaborative problem solving along the way. Yeah. Okay. Hi. So um, my question is actually, uh, it also kind of applies outside of just software. Um, and it kind of is a, a nuanced comment or concern because of the inclusion of the Panopticon model. When you're dealing with a, a, a large network of coordination and particularly transparency, um, when you think of the, the Panopticon that directs the gaze inward to this one unifying thing, but if it's completely transparent, particularly when you're describing a situation where everyone sees everyone, you're actually dealing with a, like an Omnicon where all users are, all users are surveilling all users. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a concern for potentially there, but especially when you're not dealing with necessarily a product development, um, but maybe you are there with where now is it can potentially both uh, create trust and mistrust in terms of that perceived audience at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. That the paper that our definition of transparency came from, Michael Bernstein paper published a year or two ago, uh, that paper actually is looking at transparency in a Chinese factory. 
And what it's saying about transparency is that the workers found it necessary to hide what they were doing from management because they had found efficiencies you know, that weren't quite following the rules. Uh, and they would get in trouble for being more efficient if management saw them. You know, so in that case, transparency was a bad thing. I mean, we've all heard of work to rule, right? It's a union tactic. Union members are oppressed. You just follow every single rule to the letter, no exceptions. Everything grinds to a halt, right? <laughs> so to the extent that transparency uh, kind of you know, facilitates that, yeah, I think it could be very damaging. And the all against all would be one way of possibly making that happen if everybody's your compliance officer. Thanks, Jim. This is really interesting. Um, I, in knowing a little bit about some of your other interests as well and, and where you're thinking, I'm curious about, I guess, sort of the scalability of this idea of transparency of decisions. And I know you've thought a lot about software ecosystems and in places like scientific computing and other kinds of places. And that transparency, I mean, I think if I understand correctly today, you've mostly been talking about transparency within a particular project. And, and I'm curious about how that scales up to the level of across projects that may not be on the same system, that may be in different languages, where that have different kinds of, where some of it may be open source, some may be, may be either private or corporate, other kinds of mm -hmm. things like yeah, that. Yeah, great question. So we've been looking at transparency kind of across uh, GitHub, not just within one project, but I mean, most projects don't have relationships across all of GitHub, you know, in sort of some area. Um, yeah, how does it scale? I think that's a great question. I, I think it doesn't necessarily scale very well. Uh, one of the things the developer said is that the feed in GitHub kind of tends to become useless fairly quickly if you're following really active people or a couple of really active repositories, and just totally overwhelm with stuff coming in. Uh, it sort of be like Facebook without the algorithm, right? <laughs> uh, so what we need is a good algorithm. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my students is kind of working on ways of how do you how do you provide the signals that developers need uh, and sort of get rid of some of the junk? You know, you should be able to use uh, various mach machine learning techniques. Uh, you know, try to do that. Yeah. <coughs> so it's actually, I have two questions. No? Okay. <laughs> so the first was about his last comment about uh, transparency and how to, um, you know, what kinds of other techniques there can be to kind of coordinate mm -hmm. different things. I mean, in open source, it's one thing that is pretty obvious is that the, uh, the overwhelm, like the overload when. When your project grows popular, there's enough people using it. The overload of input that goes into the core developers is absolutely is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So as a result, because open source projects are, are, are basically managementless, um, the culture that tends to, to, to uh, emerge from that is a culture that's very aggressive and nasty because the developers just don't have that management level on top that usually companies have to kind of shield the developers from all of that input management in a way in the old traditional organizations serves in a way to shield all that mm -hmm. overwhelm that comes right and that doesn't exist in open source so that's one that's one one of the interesting differences between the traditional mm -hmm. management that, so I don't know if you made any studies related to some of these differences um, I haven't explicitly looked too much at those differences. We have heard about them, I mean, differences in culture of different projects from some of our interviews. So this was an earlier set of interviews looking at uh, some, some more traditional open source projects like Eclipse and Apache and, and so on. One of our interviewees, this is one of my favorite quotes, so I remember it so much, saying that if you want to contribute to Eclipse, it's like going to your favorite aunt's at tea time and, and having cookies and tea with a few of her friends. You know, it's, if you go want to make a contribution to the Linux kernel, it's like going to a biker bar and slapping a dollar <laughs> down on the pool table. <laughs> uh, so definitely there are different cultures and clearly different kinds of people are drawn to those cultures. But, but as you're saying, that all has a purpose of kind of helping to limit and filter and select 
what external input you know actually makes it to the developers to kind of know what to attend to. Uh, it, and I think open source needs other kinds of solutions uh, for that since they don't have managers. Uh, and I, I don't know the extent to which machine learning can help filter appropriately, uh, but you know, it's kind of, I think, another step that will at least be helpful. And another interesting thing that you talked at the end is that uh, your research interest is the coordination between um, these transparent processes and other kinds of processes. So I have personal experience with working on an open source project with another an external group that comes from a very traditional military organization and the pro and they are trying to contribute but their internal processes are so orthogonally different that it was a complete disaster so it's just like how can we yeah. find these bridges that actually work well we sort of ran into that uh, when we were looking at eclipse because eclipse as you know started out as an ibm project and then they decided to open source it they gave the code to the uh, Eclipse Foundation and open source the, the project. Uh, but then IBM people were still working on it. And to this day, I believe, most of the work of the platform is done by IBM, even though it's you know, open source. Uh, so they were having, a lot of the IBM developers were having real problems with this kind of participating in the community. So um, to be a good community member, you have to go fix the highest priority bug, whether it affects you or not. Or, you know, whether it affects your company or not. maybe even helps your competitors. You know, if you're going to be a good community member, you don't worry about the community overall. And so they weren't kind of used to that. Their managers, they weren't used to having to, if they did get used to that, they weren't used to having to explain to their managers why they weren't fixing this bug that was hurting them, they were fixing this bug that was hurting their competitor instead. Uh, so they, that was a lot of misunderstanding there. Uh, and also they were worried about um, the fact that other companies watch Eclipse and watch other open source repositories that companies pay developers to contribute to for clues about their direction, product direction. You know, why are they building this into this open source? It looks like that's meant to handle blah, blah, blah. You know, so they use that as intelligence to try to figure out, you know, what the next move is. So they did things like create kind of a fire, <coughs> firewall, <coughs> sorry, a separate group uh, that would work on the open source side uh, that would be in a different place even different building than the IBM product group who would kind of interact with them to try to get them to develop what they needed in the open source, but they would never communicate with them what they were actually doing inside to try to limit the amount of information that escaped. So they, yeah, I think it's probably maybe more of a problem with military uh, interaction, but they did find some ways of kind of uh, handling that over to take some time. Two more questions. Um, you you sort of taken the, the the kinds of coordination you talked about are uh, you know team structure ge uh, geography uh, communication through mm -hmm. chat and so on you sort of took these as as they were as they existed. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you've gotten any insight into how you can re-engineer those components. I mean, different organizational designs, different uses of space. I mean, I think of the radical co-location work that mm -hmm. Judy and Stephanie did and so on, mm -hmm. or better communication tools or different kinds of ways of managing the, all the bug reports and so on. If you could redesign those pieces, that would have a big effect on all this. I think that's a great idea. I mean, we've, we've taken some baby steps in that direction, kind of along the line I was talking to uh, with, with Judy. What we were interested in doing is finding a project in its very early stage where they just kind of have the basic architecture sort of figured out. And then interviewing architects to get a very rough idea for, okay, this, you have all these components, let's talk about the interface between this component and this component. Is there one? If yes, how complex is it? How uncertain is it? Have you built 20 of these so you know exactly how it's going to go? It's very certain, or is this the first time you don't quite know? So we're trying to rate kind of each interface then on the scales of complexity and uncertainty, and then sort of get some idea of rating uh, teams to which they were thinking about assigning these, okay, they're geographically distinct or not. You know, if they're separate, okay, that their ability to coordinate is, their capacity to coordinate is lower. Um, have they worked together before? Well, then it's higher. You know, to kind of go on, so just have a very rough way of kind of measuring that and then try to see, you know, with their contemplated plan for the architecture and for the teams, you know, where are the problems? Are they really bad? You have these two highly uncertain complex things being developed by teams that have never worked together before different parts of the earth, you know, well, don't do it that way. 
so I mean that's about as far as we got. We haven't actually had the opportunity to try that out, but I would love to be able to do that. One last question. So it's interesting that you used uh, GitHub and eventually Git as the model uh, to uh, model coordination. Because Git, when it was originally conceived, was supposed to be this way of performing coordination in a decentralized, mm -hmm. distributed manner. So I wonder if, uh, if you took that into account and if you see that effect in your coordination models. For instance, do the people-to-people -people matrices turn out to be sparse? Uh, do you see, uh, again, another effect that I would be interested to see if that turns out to be true or not is, does, uh, when Git was conceived, people from all across the world were using Git to contribute to a single project like Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, geospatial coordination did not seem, so people, it was not necessary for people to be in the same place but it was more necessary for them to be somehow be coordinating with each other in this asynchronous manner. So do you see like an inverse relationship between those two models of coordination? I don't know, do you see these effects? Have you taken these things into account? So uh, <clears throat> we haven't really compared different, different sorts of version control systems, you know, centralized versus uh, distributed version control. In the uh, commercial project, it was a commercial, it was not Git, it was some other commercial uh, version control system. In GitHub, obviously, it's Git. But you're sort of saying, is there a trade off between kind of asynchronous work where people don't need to be together and right. coordination? Where it still works out just fine. And the, what you might actually end up seeing yeah. as the relationships between people, as derived from a Git oriented model, Mm -hmm. might actually not give you the full picture of the coordination requirements. Yeah, it yeah. might actually show you that they don't need any coordination or need minimal coordination, but other sources like chat logs or the fact that they are calling each other or the mm -hmm. fact that they're emailing each other might yeah. show you other facets of the coordination. Yeah, I think that's that a really a good point. Model might not show you. That's, that's a really good point. So I think just looking at any one of these data sources by itself is a very incomplete picture. We know in GitHub, for example, we're only looking at GitHub, but we know they're using uh, Stack Overflow, and they're using Twitter, and they're using all sorts of things sort of outside the Git world, and it would be great to get a more complete picture by uh, incorporating all those things. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say, and I'm just trying to end this. <laughs> I'll think of it and tell you later. <laughs> yeah, let's thank Jim again.